railings that were part of the buildings of Trinity College. Trinity College was founded in 1592 by Queen Elizabeth I of England, when she gave these lands here, which had previously belonged to the Monastery of All Hallows. This is an Augustan monastery founded by Dermot McMurrah, High King of Leinster in 1166, and closed by King Henry VIII with the suppression of the monasteries in 1534. The Queen also got the rates or taxes of 200,000 acres of land in 17 counties in Ireland for the occupant of college. We'll pass by the main entrance to Trinity College now in a moment. And we'll... The Book of Kells is a 1200 year old version of the Gospels, written in Latin by the monks in Kells in County Meath, which is about 40 miles northwest of Dublin. Also be seen here the books of Drina, Dura and Armagh, and these are 7th, 8th and 9th century versions of the Gospels, also written in Latin. That's the main entrance to Trinity College there now to your left. I would have stopped three coming up as soon as we got through the traffic lights here. Calls me. Nine and a half thousand for these are academic. Trinity College. Of the college that we founded in 1592, none remains today. That is mainly a wooden structure. The oldest part Trinity of the college. Event. Indeed, there's every Irish gift worker, craft That's worker's dream and ambition to have his wares That's exhibited true. and sold on this street. And we'll have another city tour stop coming up here, stop number four, if you want to go shopping in Nassau Street. It's also the stop for the National yeah, Museum or the National Library. Now, if you want to visit the museum or the library, uh, when you get off the bus, you come to the next set of traffic lights and turn right. That's Kildare Street. And both the museum and library are halfway up Kildare Street on the left-hand side. Then coming up here on your left-hand side, this is formerly Finn's Hotel. Indeed, you can still see Finn's Hotel written here on the Gable End. And it was in Finn's Hotel that Nora Barnacle worked as a chambermaid. And she later went on to marry James Joyce, the man who mortalised the city in his book Ulysses. Ulysses tells the travels of one fictional Leopold Bloom to the streets of Dublin on the 16th of June 1904. We celebrate that day here in the city each year on the 16th of June and we call it Bloom's Day. And when you dress up in the costume of the period, many of the pubs and hotels in the city will sell you alcohol for the prices they sold them in 1904. Unfortunately, they only do it on the 16th of June. Otherwise, we'll be going around dressed up in the costume of 1904 all the time. 16 June 16. We're coming up now on to Marion Square. Marion Square is the grandest of the five Georgian squares we have here in the city. It was laid out in 1762 by John Enzer for the sixth law of Fitzwilliam, the heir to Marion. Back in the 19th century, anybody who's anyone in Irish society lived in Marion Square. Oscar Wilde for a while here, number one. That's it coming up here on your left, just past the traffic lights. There's the American College in Dublin today. Daniel O'Connell for the main streets, caught after living at number 58. And Sheridan the Fawn, the creator of the Gothic novel, lived at number 17. Indeed, you can see a monument of Oscar Wilde there to your left, inside the railings. He's lying on a rock, looking across the house where he once lived. Now, we another city tour stop here. This is stop number five. This is the one for the National Gallery, which is about 50 metres up here on the right hand side. Morning. That's the old room, that's right. Uh, coming up here on the right hand side inside the black railings with the National Gallery of Ireland. Split between 1848 and 1854. All the major European schools of art are all represented in here. Jack Yates, the Irish painter, is the only one with the distinction of having a room within your right with Leinster House. This was built in 1745 in the Duke of Leinster Museum. The Natural History Museum is better known as the Dead Zoo. In there are mummified animals, fish, birds and insects. It's also a museum piece in its own right, and it's a Victorian museum which has never been modernised. Unfortunately, the museum is closed at the moment that an incident in here a couple of months ago in which the stairs collapsed. And if that problem was sorted out, the museum will be remaining closed. But this is our stop number six. By the government of the formation of the state, and they're now the department of the Taoiseach. The Taoiseach being our Prime Minister. It comes from the old Gaelic word chieftain. Our present chieftain and our Prime Minister is a man called Bertie Ahern. Unlike other countries, our Prime Minister does not have an official residence. He lives in his own private accommodation, the sites is Marion Row. Seven doors up on the left hand side of Marion Row is O'Donoghue's pub. O'Donoghue's pub has two claims to fame. It is said can squeeze in more bodies per square foot than any other pub in the city or had not been invented at the time. The vulgar railings in front of them to prevent passers by from falling into the basements. It is said there's no two Georgian doorways alike. 
so you can have a look as we drive through and see for yourself. The door is usually made of boarding oak. If you look up the buildings, you notice the windows get smaller as you ascend. This is to give the impression of height. These houses are built here, they all had lamp boxes over the door. So they are very few of them have, but this first one here to your right has. You can see the lamp box and the fan light there just over the door. Oh. And in that lamp box you put a lighted lamp or a candle if you were receiving visitors. If you knew your mother-in-law was coming, you made sure there was no light in the box. <laughs> this takes us on to Sir Stephen's Green. Sir Stephen's Green is the oldest of the five Georgian squares we have here in the city. It was originally laid out in 1668 but led out in its present format in 1880 by Lord Arden Loon, Sir Arthur Guinness. Stop. Okay, all right. Okay. Yeah, it's okay. No, green part. Okay, take care, mate. Stephen Green. Stephen Green. <laughs> You two played uh, three major concerts here in uh, Crow Park, okay, okay, on the north side of Dublin uh, last year. Crow Park has a capacity of 83,000, and the three concerts were sold out almost immediately. Indeed, the promoter said that it could stage 10 concerts in Crow Park, but the notes were in council in 1715, and it has been the residence of the Lord Mayor ever since, now known as the Mansion House. With the city coat of arms down in front of the building with the inscription in Latin, which I won't read for you because I can't, but translated to English it says, Happy the city, where the citizens obey. Uh, the roadway coming up here to your right of the traffic lights, uh, this is Molesel Street. And Molesel Street takes you up to the front entrance or the town entrance of Leinster House of Parliament. That's it you see there now at the top of the street. To the right of that with the National Museum, to the left is the National Library. The Museum and Library, they're open here Tuesday to Saturday 10 to 5, and then on Sundays they're open 2 to 5. Admission to both is free. The museum has a few exhibitions going on at the moment. It's got the Prehistoric Ireland exhibition, Ireland's Gold, the Treasury, the Road to Independence, a Decorative Arts exhibition, and a Viking Age exhibition. We've done around the block. We're back down to Trinity College again. The building's from Rest Dr. Douglas Hyde, who founded the Gaelic League in 1893. It is said without Dr. Douglas Hyde in the Gaelic League, the Irish language would not have survived until today as a spoken language. The tourist office. And the tourist office here to the left of what was St. Andrew's Church. Oh, church, yeah. The church that stands at the site of the Tingmoat. The Tingmoat is a large earthen mound, 60 foot high and 200 foot wide. It was built by the Vikings back in Viking times. It was there that they held court and had games. It is demolished in the art of forms today. But the House of Lords has been retained as it was prior to 1800. It is used by the bank for board meetings. It's also open for visits on request. The area into your right there is known as Temple Bar or Dublin's Left Bank. It's a bohemian area in character and has said it is possible to enjoy the Cossian or practically any country in the world in this area. And we'll have another city tour stop coming up here when we get past the traffic lights, stop number nine. Uh, for anybody who wants to visit uh, Temple Bar. Temple Any of the roadways here yeah. into the right here uh, would take you into the centre of Temple Bar. Indeed, all these roadways here to the right, they're all part of Temple Bar. In front of them. We're just going to enter the old medieval city of Dublin here at this junction. There was a gate here, the Dame Gate, which took you into the medieval city. The area this side is known as... And it is here that our city council meets under the chairmanship of the Lord. See the hall. See the hall. And City Hall has an exhibition going on in here to the left called The Story of the Capital. They've also got a cafe uh, shop. City Hall. And just beyond City Hall into the left is the only view we'll have of the bus of Dublin Castle. Dublin Castle was built on a ridge overlooking the rivers Liffey and Pottle on the origin of King John of England in 1204. See the hall. The buildings you see into the left here behind the railings, they're the stale apartments. I'll tell you more about the State Apartments in a moment. You want to visit Dublin Castle, that's the entrance there to your left. Dublin Castle. Now, this is stop number 10. Dublin Castle. Church of Ireland Synod Hall, which links up with it. an idea. This Synod Hall is no yeah. longer in use by the Church of Ireland since the bishops. Church. This order a number of years ago. It is now opened up as the Dublinia Exhibition Centre. Uh, this is an audio visual exhibition which traces life through Dublin. This area is associated with Sir Patrick himself. 
St. Patrick converted to Dubliner, some paganism, and Christianity here in 450. And a well he used to baptize his newly converted Christians was found in St. Patrick's Park. Saint the stone Patrick which covers Cathedral. the well is now on display in the Saint cathedral. Patrick. The choir school at the Spartan Cathedral was founded in 1432 and it took part in the first performance of Handel's Messiah. Now this is stop number 12 for anybody who wants to visit St. Patrick's Cathedral. Uh, next, coming up here on our left hand side, we have Marsh's Library. Marsh's Library is the oldest public library in Ireland. It dates back to 1701. It was designed by Sir William Robinson, the Crown Architect for Narcissus Marsh. Narcissus Marsh is a bishop of St. Patrick's Cathedral. The library has over 25,000 rare books and 250 rare manuscripts. It's also got fine oak panelling and shelving. It's got three cages in which readers of rare books were locked in. Uh, that's the deanery of St. Patrick's Cathedral. And the most famous dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral was Dean Jonathan Swift. Jonathan Swift, he was dean of St. Patrick's Cathedral between 1713 and 1745. He wrote many famous books, among them being Gulliver's Travels, A Modest Proposal, The Tale of a Tub and The Drapery of Letters. He's buried in the centre royal of the Cathedral and his epitaph is written one and That's one of the four most psychiatric hospitals in Ireland. It's a teaching hospital of Trinity College. Many of the psychiatrists are professors and lecturers out of Trinity College. Jonathan Swift set up the hospital under a board of governors of his trusted friends because he wanted the inmates to be treated as patients, not as criminals, which they had been up to that time. And the hospital is still run today by a board of governors, stepping across, the time to market open in the morning and then it closed in the evening. And the reason he had to do that was because he left one wife in England and came over and married another one here. So maybe it's just as good this high cross is gone. We're just going to turn into High Street. And high Street's the old main street from Medieval Dublin. Medieval Dublin was quite small. It was only one mile long and 750 yards wide. And surrounded by a stone wall which was pierced by nine gates. As the city expanded, the wall became obsolete. Because most of the city was outside of the walls. And there was the National College of Art and Design. This was formerly Powers Whiskey Distillers. Powers amalgamated with Jemison, Tullamore, Jew and Bushmills back in the 1970s in order to become Irish distillers. They've now got a and that's why they amalgamated together. Whiskey was introduced to Ireland back in the Middle Ages. It was brought here by Crusaders coming back from the Crusades. The Crusaders found whiskey in the Middle East. Whiskey was used in the Middle East by the Arabs as a perfume. But of course the Irish found a better use for it and they got it home. The street we're on now is Thomas Street. And that road right there to your left is Mead Street. There's another one of the major shopping areas here in Dublin. But this area is lost out in latter years to both Henry Street and Grafton Street. There's another major big multiple stores ever set up here. They all prefer either Henry Street or Grafton Street. And then you can find nearly all the big multinationals of both of these streets. And all the shops you see around here are all small family owned businesses. But even so, okay, we're coming into the heart of Guinness's Brewery. Okay. The brewery runs on both sides of the road here. Arthur Guinness, he bought an old used brewery on four acres back in 1759 with a 9,000 year lease. And he started the brewery's famous Black Porter. Today the brewery it covers 64 acres. It's the largest brewery in Europe. It brews two and a half million pints of Guinness each day and exports 300 million pints annually. We'll come up to the Guinness storehouse now in a few minutes. The Guinness storehouse is around the back here. It opened up here uh, just over four years ago. It was four years open here, I'm sorry, it's open almost eight years. It'd be eight years open here on the 10th of December. And one of the first visitors here was the farmer of Merlion. More than 90% of these come from overseas. This is hard to surprise me because this is a national survey carried out a few years ago. The Guinness is the world's most recognisable Irish brand. So you want to see how the famous pint of blue creators, or even the tins, they made a stop 13 coming up from yeah, yeah, really. We'll have a bus back here every 10 minutes up at 4.45. For 4.45, it'll be 5.45 for every 15 minutes. And for 5.45, it'll be 7.15 for every 30 minutes. If you're not able to make it back on one of these buses by yourself, don't worry, some of us will give you a hand. Yeah. Uh, and I'm, uh, yeah. 
Yeah. Uh, Guinness yeah. spent 50 million euro here in 2000, uh, converting this warehouse here in front of us to be the new storehouse. This is Guinness's contribution to the new millennium. Now, if you want to visit the Guinness storehouse, uh, when you get off the bus, uh, you go in the next gate where here to your left. Well, the lorry is going in there, and it's the first door on the left-hand side after you win the gate. Oh. It's now stop 30. <laughs> oh, well, what do you have? What do you have? What do you have? Can I take your bike? What do you have? 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 Okay, bye, thank you. Thank you. Vô đây anh phải bê nha, mười mấy đồng á. Mười mấy vừa ngon á. Hình như ở trong khu kia mấy con. Yeah, he's sitting down street for the traffic jam. Why shouldn't he hand me up? Different tastes, distinctive tastes, okay? You're working your way up to brewing on the, on the first floor. 
the brewery process from day one to day ten, depending on you work with the advertising, coupons, transport, how we transport things around the world, advertising on the second floor, you work with the third floor, okay? The fourth floor is choice, the fifth floor is two bars, there's a restaurant and there's a brewery bar and a source bar where you get all the Guinness draft periods. You also get a, a point of Guinness included with your ticket. So you get a complimentary point of Guinness, whatever you like to call it, included with your ticket. And that's the whole tour. And it's a very intellectual tour. So you learn a lot. You leave the Guinness store. Like, how, uh, uh, how long did you say? And how long did it take? About an hour and a half. It depends on yourself. It's self-guided. Oh, 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 oh. It depends on you. If you it depends on how long you want to take. Oh, it's the same camera. <laughs> I have. Oh same yeah. Time, but they're good, aren't they? Yeah, good, good. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Okay. The same one. Okay. Cost how much? Fourteen dollars. Fourteen, 14 euro. euro. Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Dublin City Council or Dublin Corporation as it used to be known and then rented out at a greatly reduced rate to people who were unable to uh, uh, buy their own properties, couldn't afford to buy their own properties. Now most of them are privately owned nowadays. Now they're, they're called flats and not apartments. Now somebody once asked me what was the difference between a flat and an apartment. The answer is about 150,000 euro. That's the only difference. If you call it an apartment you can charge more. Simple as that. Now a lot of people who lived in those flats till he tragically drowned. Indeed, my own father-in-law told me lots of stories. Do you know that the Guinness staff actually every day received an allowance of two bottles of Guinness? This is true actually. They would receive two bottles of Guinness every day as a perk for working in the factory. And he, he used to tell me about guys who were permanently drunk who worked in the Guinness factory because they were quite ingenious. They'd rigged up all different kinds of apparatus where they could get the, the Guinness out of the vats without being seen. And he said there was guys that used to be walking around there just apparently drunk all the time. And they used to get this uh, allowance of a couple of points. Back in, uh, pregnant women were encouraged to drink Guinness. That's why all the babies have black hair. <laughs> now we're turning on to uh, high tides and storm surges. The river has actually come over these walls here and flooded the surrounding areas. But that hasn't happened for quite a number of years now. The river itself flows on out into Dublin Bay. 
and Dublin Bay is a deep sea port. I'm celebrating its 300th anniversary actually as a deep sea port. And Dublin Bay, in fact, was developed by a very famous gentleman, or I should say infamous gentleman, because it was none other but Captain Bly, the same Captain Bly from Mutiny on the Bounty fame, who developed Dublin Bay as a deep command of jail in 21. The Anglo-Irish Treaty was signed. In this treaty, it gave partial independence to 26 of the 32 counties of Ireland. And those 26 counties were initially known as the Irish Free State. However, in 1949, became known as the Republic of Ireland. And this is where you are today. Dublin is the capital of the Republic of Ireland. To the north of the country, six counties were to remain under British jurisdiction and still do to this very day. Those six counties, of course, are always referred to as Northern Ireland and Belfast is the capital of Northern Ireland. Now, all the troubles you would have heard about here in Ireland, which started more or less mid-1960s, mid to late 1960s, up until the mid-1990s, when you would have heard about the troubles here in Ireland, well, most of these would have been taken place, in fact, in Northern Ireland, because in the north, you had a group of people known as nationalists, usually Catholics, who wished for a united Ireland. On the other side, then, you would have the Protestants, who are known as loyalists or unionists, who are loyal to the crown, and still to this day, they wish to remain part of the United Kingdom, part of the British Commonwealth. So the Irish Republican Army, or IRA as it's known, I'm sure you would have heard about, carried out a terrorist campaign for over 30 years in Northern Ireland. And there was uh, terrorist organisations on the loyalist or Protestant side as well, most notably the likes of the UDA, the LDF, the UVF, these are the Ulster Volunteer Force, Loyalist Volunteer Force and Ulster Defence Association. On the Republican side then you'd have the IRA, the Irish Republican Army. Also you'd have the INLA, the Irish Nationalist Liberation Army. I know it's all starting to sound a bit like the life of Brian really. People's Front of Judea, Judean People's Front. Now these sides carried out a terrorist campaign for over 30 years and now in excess of three to over 3,000 people were killed in the troubles in Northern Ireland. Now thankfully since the Good Friday Agreement, the mid-1990s peace has come to Northern Ireland and hopefully prosperity will follow. Indeed, if you get the chance you should visit Northern Ireland because it has one of the most, some of the most beautiful countryside you'll find anywhere in Ireland is found in the north of the country. Particularly up the north coast there, the countryside is absolutely stunning and of course you'll find the likes of the Giant's Causeway up there which is definitely well worth a visit. If you are travelling from the Republic to the north of course you will notice some uh, differences. Now nowadays you'll, you'll cross over the border without noticing you've even crossed over the border back during the Troubles of course all the border points were manned by uh, British Army checkpoints no longer like that to this day you just go straight on through basically if you do head up to Northern Ireland of course you will have to change your currency because of course they accept they only use the sterling in Northern Ireland whereas in the Republic we use the Euro and of course you will notice as well all the signposts in Northern Ireland are only in English whereas in the Republic they're in two languages, Irish and English. The tier group who carried out most of the work on the building itself. And they brought the jail back to how it would have looked when originally built. There's an excellent guided tour of the jail and an audio-visual display and a very, very good museum. Now, as I was saying earlier, the Irish Museum of Modern Art, if you wish to go to it, you can go. If you just look to the front and to the left, there is an entrance to it just there. So it's within walking distance of stop 15. Now something to bear in mind actually, in Kilmainham Jail as well, is that it was a jail where children were sentenced. And indeed records show of one eight-year-old girl receiving a sentence of hard labour in Kilmainham Jail for stealing a loaf of bread. Oh, yeah. Now it's just coming up on our left-hand side. Check something out here because uh, they've been filming the series of the Tudors here recently. There's the entrance to the jail just there on the left hand side. Just there to the gates. Jail. And this here now is stop number 15 on the tour. Or Kilmainham Jail. Now <laughs> <laughs> uh, the, the last prisoner to be released from, released from Kilmainham Jail in 1924 was a gentleman called Eamon de Valera. De Valera, or Dev as he was known here in Ireland, he actually went on to become Prime Minister of Ireland. 
several occasions actually he was Prime Minister. I hope none of you any under any difficulty understanding what I'm saying. I have a very strong Dublin accent. Well, I would do. I've never lived anywhere else. <laughs> and uh, people in Dublin do, do tend to speak very quickly. Now, I do slow it down on purpose. I usually speak an awful lot quicker than this, I can assure you. So I slow it down so you can understand what I'm saying. Most people don't have any difficulty in understanding me. Although a number of weeks back, actually, quite funny, um, a gentleman said to me, he said he had difficulty understanding what he was saying. Ironically enough, he was Scottish. I hadn't got a clue what he was saying to me. It took me about 10 minutes to figure out what he was actually saying. I was thinking of taking up Scottish, actually, as a foreign language. It's quite easy, actually, after all. It's just a mixture of English and alcohol. <laughs> I'm only joking. Scottish, of course, are a Celtic race as well, just like us. They're our closest relations, really, the Scottish are. And of course, there is a huge Irish population in Scotland also. And indeed, the Scottish language as well, the original Scottish language, is almost identical to the Irish language, Gaelic. Two Gaelic languages. And a lot of the words actually are very similar, in fact, they're identical. In Ireland, Falsha means welcome. part of the train station itself. Now Houston train station was built in 1848 and was originally called King's Bridge Station. However in 1966 it was renamed Houston Station in honour of a chap called Sean Houston who was a railroad worker in the train station itself and also one of the leaders of the 1916 uprising. Oh. It's the busiest train station in the country and it's where you get the train if you're heading to the south or to the west of the country. Side. There you go, there's the pedestrian entrance train now station. the train station itself. So this here is stop number 16 on the tour for Houston train station. Uh, we move on, our next stop is going to be stop 17 and it's for the Phoenix Park and Dublin Zoo. <laughs> We're going to cross back over the River Liffey now, heading from the south side of the city back onto the north side of the city. And we'll actually be staying on the north city for the remainder of this particular tour. We'll be turning left now and heading up Park Gate Street, which leads us up to the Phoenix Park. Oh, Phoenix Park. Yeah. Phoenix Park. Phoenix. Phoenix, this bridge here, just on the left-hand side, was built in 1821, and it was built when King George IV paid. Now we're going to be turning right in a moment into the Phoenix Park. Phoenix Park is the largest enclosed park in Europe. It's 1,752 acres in size. So that would make it five times bigger than Hyde Park in London and twice the size of Central Park in New York. Oh. So, na 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 na, ours is bigger than yours. <laughs> the walls that stretch around the park are actually 11 kilometres or 7 miles long. Oh. Now, originally, the park was established as a private oh. hunting reserve by the Duke of Ormond in the 17th century. Now, in the 18th century, the park was opened up gas powered. They're the only gas powered lighting system still in use, in public use, in Why are you handling this very day. Oh. Now, one of the tallest monuments to be found in the Phoenix Park is just coming up on the left-hand side. If you have a look out to your left, you're going to see it now in a moment. Over 200 feet tall, there you go, was Arthur Wellesley, and he was born and bred in Dublin. Although, he absolutely hated the fact that he was Irish. He always referred to himself as being English. Indeed, he is very famously quoted as having said, just because one was born in a stable does not make one a horse. And it didn't stop him from becoming an ass, though. <laughs> there is an area of the park, just coming up, see out here to our left hand side, this is where all the sports fields are in the Phoenix Park. Now it's commonly referred to as the 15 acres although it does cover more than 200 acres. Now that little building you see to your left is one of the two cricket pavilions. Now cricket
cricket, of course, being a quintessentially English sport, it's very popular here in Dublin, particularly in Dublin, actually. It was very popular throughout Ireland. And, of course, that would stem back to our time as being part of the British Commonwealth. Indeed, the second cricket pavilion is just coming up in front of us and on the left-hand side. Of course, also out here to the left, you'll find soccer being played. Soccer is a very popular sport here in Ireland as well. And, of course, our own traditional sports, such as Gaelic football and hurling, also take place here in Bailey's Park. And the Gaelic pitches themselves are just coming up here on the left-hand side. You may notice that the goalposts, they're very similar to the goalposts that you would see. And a gathering of people who were to take place in Ireland's history took place here in the Bailey's Park on the 29th of September, 1979. Now, while on a visit here, above the gate, flag of the United States of America and yeah. the Irish flag, and that's the entrance into the home of the United States Ambassador to Ireland, oh, and that right. is the only ambassador's residence which is allowed in the Phoenix Park. Oh. <laughs> and the only other official residence, the entrance to this one, is coming up on the left. There you go, see those white gates there on the left-hand side. That'll bring you into Horace and Oogderon, translated into English, literally means the home of the president. Oh. That's where the Irish president lives. The current Irish president is a lady by the name of Mary McAleese. Indeed, she's from Northern Ireland and is our very first president from the North of Ireland. She's been going through her second term in office and the president can only serve two terms in office. However, each term does last for seven years. Now, I'm going to slow down. If you keep looking out to your left, you're going to get a much better view now in a moment of the you don't have George W for 14 years instead of 8. Ah, pretty soon, of course, in the United States, your next president is also going to be female. <laughs> now in the Phoenix Park, of course, you'll find Dublin Zoo. And Dublin Zoo is one of the oldest zoos in the world, actually, built in the 1830s. Now the zoo itself is just coming up on our left hand side, in fact that green fencing there is part of the zoo, the road to the left. Now not allowed to stop here, I don't know why they're waving me down, I can't stop, I can't stop here, I stop further on down the street. Actually, they don't even have tickets for this bus. And indeed, Dublin Zoo became very famous for its lion breeding programme, and in fact, the lion that you see roaring at the start of the MGM movies is roaring with a Dublin accent. Because <laughs> he was born in Dublin Zoo in the 1920s. <laughs> now, we're not allowed to put up official bus stops here in the Phoenix Park. So I will show you exactly where we stop. This is where you would get off the bus and where you would rejoin the tour also. It's the first of these gas-powered lamps having come through the roundabout. The very first one here on the left-hand side it's directly opposite the Wellington Memorial there on our right hand side. So this here is stop 17 for the Phoenix Park, Dublin Zoo. Reminiscent of when John F. Kennedy visited Ireland in the early 1960s. Because Bill Clinton of course played, played a huge part in the peace process in Northern Ireland. He was very involved in the whole Good Friday Agreement. So he really is loved in this country. And when he visits, actually he tends to come here quite a lot because he's a very keen golfer, of course. And of course, Ireland has some of the best golf courses in the world. George yeah. W. <laughs> wouldn't be very much loved here. <laughs> but then again, you could count the countries on the, on the fingers of one hand. I think where George W. is like. But indeed, we're going to be going down Park Eight Street now in a moment. And there's a very famous bar on Park Eight Street called Ryan's Bar. Now, it's a Victorian bar and uh, they serve food there at the weekends. Now, during the week, midweek, it doesn't open till later on in the evening. But Bill Clinton actually stopped off in Ryan's Bar and had a pint of Guinness while he pays a visit here to Dublin in the mid-1990s. Um, 
The left hand side is Ryan's Bar with the restaurant above it, FXB's. And this now is stop number 18 on the tour. For Ryan's of Parkgate Street. You'll have the decorative fine arts exhibition. There's an excellent military exhibition called Soldiers and Chiefs. There's a uh, Irish High Cross. <laughs> it's for the old Jemison Whiskey Distillery. And of course, everybody knows it was the Irish. It was the Irish who invented whiskey. In fact, they say it was invented by monks here in Ireland. So they say, anyway. And in fact, the the Gaelic or Irish for whiskey is actually Ishka Baha, and that means water of life. Now, okay. indeed, the English name whiskey comes from that Irish word Ishka. Ishka means water. Whiskey is what the English called it. Ishka whiskey. You see, they're very similar sounding. That's where the name whiskey comes from. Now, the old Jamison Distillery, which will be our next stop, it's no longer a working distillery, and nowadays it's a very fine museum. It's a bit, I think it's seven euro fifty in. I'm pretty sure that's what it is. It's seven euro fifty. You'll get a euro to our right. You see that large modern office building over there to our right hand side. That's called the Dublin Civic Offices. But just as we're going by there, if you look over to your right, there's a little narrow sh that the very first performance. Now we are heading on Litty, down right into the heart Litty. of the city centre. Liffy. 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 And we're going to pass by in a moment at one of the newest parts of the city, actually, and it's called the Italian Quarter. Now it's coming up, as I go through these traffic lights in front, you just look to your left here. See this little area here to our left, down this lane, right? There you go. Down to our left. That was only built in the last two to three years. It's built by a, a local builder, a chap called Wallace. Now it's called the Italian Quarter, and although very new, it's built to be very successful and indeed a very, very popular with everybody here in Dublin. But through the archway, you're right into the heart of Everything. Temple Bar. So now this is just coming down, stop 21. Don't worry, is that? The River Cruise, that starts just there on the right hand side, that blue kiosk there is their office. And the Arlington Hotel, which is there on the left. So stop number 21 on the tour, folks. What are you doing? What are you doing? What are you doing? Now our next stop is going to be stop number 22. Stop 22 is for Dublin Bus Head Office and O'Connell Street. Now Dublin Bus is the name of the company which O'Connell Street. O'Connell, look at it. O'Connell. Several other tours. They're known as coastal or half day tours. And uh, a lot of the, the street lost it. Had no character really. It was just kind of full of burger <laughs> joints, you know, McDonald's and Burger Kings and all that kind of thing. So in the last number of years, they have spent an awful lot of money in revamping the street. Not quite a good job. Street were actually destroyed during the uprising in 1916, and also uprising in 1963. Now we're just turning back onto Parnell Street. Uh, we're just going past, just to the front of us on the right hand side here, to find the Tulsa Maternity Hospital. That was Europe's very first purpose built maternity hospital. It was built by a chap called Bartholomew Moss 250 years ago. Actually, they're celebrating that anniversary now, the 250th anniversary. Now, all babies born in the Rotunda Hospital, of course, are incredibly good looking. Three daughters, Molly was born in the Rotunda. And they say there's a nine month wait list to get in there. Now we're coming around to stop 23. 
there is for the Dublin City Gallery, which is free in. Excellent gallery. And there, of course, you'll find Francis Bacon's studio. Now, the gallery entrance is just coming up on the left. That fa fabulous Georgian house on the left. The oh, Writers' Museum is at the top of the street, just on the left-hand side, just before the big old church. Stop 23. So we're just leaving stop 23. Now our next stop is actually going to be back down at stop number one on the tour. Now when we get back down to stop number one, you will have to transfer off of my bus and onto the tour bus which will be waiting there. Now obviously the driver of the tour bus which is waiting at stop number one is not going to be nearly as handsome or witty or charming. I'm Phil, he's Bill, we're the flower pot men. He'll be the driver to take you on your way. Now you'll have a good laugh at Bill though, he's good fun. Gosh, your tickets are valid, as I said earlier, for 24 hours from the time of purchase. So you can take the tour as often as you like during that 24 hour period. One thing to note actually, if you're uh, out and about at night time in Dublin City, just remember of course nowadays, it is a major city. And indeed, the population I read recently of the Greater Dublin area has now reached 1.6 million people. So, of course, it's a major city. So just bear that in mind when you're out and about. So uh, do take care with your personal belongings, particularly your handbags. Just uh, bear in mind, of course, you're in a major city. Although a relatively crime-free city, actually, in recent the World Health Organization, of all people, I don't know why it was them, but uh, they were the group that released the figures. And they said that uh, Dublin, in fact, one of the most crime-free cities in Europe. And of course, you'll have great fun in Dublin. And I read an article in the paper today that said that according to the, uh, oh, it's a group, Travel Guide Group, the name escapes me now at the moment. Oh, I'll tell you what their name is now, because I have the article right in front of me. Oh, The Lonely Planet. They said that Dublin, and indeed Ireland, is the most welcoming country in the world. Oh. And they say it's down to our dark oh, sense of humour. Whatever they mean by that. So, of course, you will enjoy yourself while you're in Dublin. It's one thing we do well in this city, and that's enjoy ourselves. So now, folks, when I get down to the traffic lights, they're going to be turning right. And I'll be pulling up onto O'Call Brewer Street, and the tour bus will be waiting there up to stop to take you on your way. Bill will take you on the rest of your way. Yeah, uh, I hope you enjoyed yourself on the tour with me today. My name is Phil. And if you didn't enjoy yourself, well, then my name is Patrick, or Jimmy, or Gary, or John. There you see it, the tour bus is in front of us, I'll pull up right behind him. So just transfer off of this bus folks and onto that bus in front of you and he'll take you on the rest of your way. Thanks very much for your time and I hope you enjoy the rest of your stay here in Dublin. So I'll transfer onto the bus in front folks.
đi con con từ nào đi hả đi con con đi rồi con đi xíu là con thằng xe này thằng xe thôi thôi có những cái gì mình mình nếu mình đi gặp con con bây giờ bây giờ đi bao nhiêu giờ nó tới? Hả? Thì mà mười phút, mười phút. Thôi thì cái này đi đứng rửa tiếng ngồi cái kia. Trời ơi, trời nói là sáng ấy. Không hiểu mà.
Street here in the capital of Dolan, and it's named after a chap called Daniel O'Connell. Now I'll tell you more about Daniel O'Connell in a couple of minutes when we get nearer to his monument. Now just come up in front of us there. Now you have to be able to see it. You have the Millennium Spire. Now if you can't see it, well Specs Savers have a special offer on. Now the spire, well it's 120 meters tall. And it's three meters at the base, tapered to 15 centimeters. Now, the Millennium Spire, well, it was built in 2003. Three years too late. Now, on your right-hand side there, well, that's six-column building. That's the General Post Office. Now, in 1916, now, they spent about 50 years attacking the monasteries here in this country. And they eventually settled in 841. Trinity College itself, it is home to some 15,000 students every year. I guess so. Yeah, did you hear me?